Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. Today's guest is Sam Kling, CSAC Senior Vice President of Creative Operations. Before CSAC, Sam was at Peer Music as Vice President there in charge of Pop A&R and Film and TV Creative Operations. I first met him over at the UCLA's Anderson School of Management, where he got his executive MBA, and we talked at his offices in Los Angeles. And this is in the early 90s, right around the time when Janet Jackson was starting to blend the sounds of hip-hop with R&B. My brother wrote a song with a friend of his that I thought was really good, and I convinced one of our patrons to allow me to come into his office and play him this record. That guy was named Eddie, he's still named Eddie O'Loughlin, and he had a, a record company called Next Plateau Records, and probably most famous for the female rap group Salt and Peppa. He let me come up to his office and he listened to my demo tape. And after listening to the one song that I was really excited about, he said, you know, I thought this was going to be like a 30 second meeting where you played me some really bad music. And I said, thanks very much. Never come back. But you've actually brought me a hit and I want to buy it from you. And I have an artist that I'm ready to put on it. And I had no idea what to do. I had no no expectation of that being the result of this meeting. I dug into my book of New York City street hustle and started trying to bargain from a position of power and making sure that my brother who wrote the song would produce it and we'd get paid. And he's like, absolutely, we're going to take care of you and put us in touch with your lawyer. And that opened a door for me in the music industry. And I never looked back. So how did you get from that to being part of much more formal organizations that have been trying to deal with the changing music industry? So once I knew that my brother, who was my first client and my beginning in the music industry was as an artist, producer, songwriter, manager, and that lasted from about 1993 through 2004, once I understood that I had good product, I was able to convince people to take meetings with me. I very quickly built a big Rolodex of powerful A&R people. And it's a a story that I love to tell is that in the late 90s, I could get the three heads of Interscope Records on the phone. I could get the CEO of Atlantic Records on the phone, and I could get the CEO of Island Records on the phone. And that was a pretty amazing position to be in when you're, you know, a 20-something-year-old knucklehead trying to to blaze careers for for your roster. Well, soon after Polygram sold to Universal, it all began began to change. And there's a dramatic uh, shifting of power in the music industry at that time. And then that was soon, I guess, almost a perfect storm backed up by Napster. So between these transactions that were happening on a high line business level and then the shifting or the removal of the gate, the destruction of the gatekeeping process in distribution of music, there was a major paradigm shift, and I was not at all prepared to handle that. Was anybody prepared well to handle it? Some people did better than others. Okay. All right. You know, gr- gr- just grinded out a career for the next three years and realized that my personal management company wasn't really going anywhere. I had built up a lot of contacts in the film and television space or synchronization space in Los Angeles. A friend of mine who was working at Bertelsmann at the time said there was a job opening for which I'd be perfect inside of BMG and he put me up for the job and I flew out and met the hiring manager who thought I was a complete long shot. I didn't know where you were going with that complete. Long shot, yeah. Completely not appropriate for the job. Okay. I'm an artist manager. This, they're looking for very specific contact and relationships and synchronization. I could tell that from the meeting, and I'd flown to Chicago to meet her. I got on the plane, and I typed up this email, and by the time the plane landed, I had an interview with the president of the company. So she liked my follow-up a lot, and I never looked back. We moved from New York to Los Angeles in September of 
2004. This is where I've been ever since. So you went from being an entrepreneur working with artists to being part of larger organizations and now CSAC. And you came on board at CSAC when? I joined CSAC in June of 2014. It's been a while. Yep. And it's an interesting thing because most people think of an entrepreneur as somebody who is uh, driving their own business and taking a lot of risk to establish a business. But there's also a very entrepreneurial approach that, that a person can bring inside of major companies. And I think that is a lot of what drives major companies, at least the companies who are innovating and doing interesting things in the marketplace right now. You as a professional then who's been both an entrepreneur and now with several different organizations of various sizes in the music industry have had to work with innovation happening with music. What do you think of when you think of innovation and music? What's innovation to you? There are several layers of innovation in music. Innovation in music itself as far as songwriting goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there have been some incredible innovators over the past, say, 15 years. And I'm speaking mainly on a commercial level. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wonderful music being made that most people don't hear. But f from the m perspective of the music industry, I'd like to focus just on on sort of what you hear on the radio or in film and television. And the folks that you work with, represent, percent. catalyze, etc. Exactly. So there have certainly been some wonderful songwriters to come along over the past 15 years. It's been a real pleasure watching the progression of songwriting happen and sort of the trends. One of the great songwriters who I had the honor of working with is a woman named Esther Dean. Watching her sort of take alliteration and make that the hottest thing on the radio between, say, 2010 and 2013 was a lot of fun. I mean, it was a great honor to be involved with the song, songs that she wrote, I mean, songs like Firework for Katy Perry or uh, What's My Name for Rihanna. So, so we tend to think of innovation. We oftentimes go right to technology and not necessarily to changing patterns or cultural right. options, etc. Right. So there's that too. Innovation or disruption is what one could argue changed my career path, mm -hmm. right? And many people in the music industry's career path. It's interesting that it's taken 15 or 16 years for legitimate and viable business models to come to fruition that are really just the a better execution of what Napster was. In, in 1999. So that they're able to actually deliver the promise of directly to the fan music? Right. For a price point that feels like free. Yeah. And a quality that hopefully is better than the original Napster experience. W absolutely. Which was kind of the leading thread that was coming out of this is if only we could deliver something that was a decent quality, then we could compete with Napster. Right. And there's a lot of there are a lot of things that needed to be developed in order to make that happen. I mean, you know, everybody at the time Napster really launched, most people were still on dial up. And if they had cell phones, it was a dumb cell phone. Right. So there's a lot of one G. A lot of technolo yeah, one G, that's right. So there's a lot of technological innovation that happened to bring us to where we are today. And from a business standpoint, one could argue that record labels are experiencing you know, more difficulties than ever before as far as monetizing what they do. Music publishers, their income streams are transitioning, and music licensing remains pretty much the same, but it will also transition. One could argue that the, the innovation has not necessarily led to a broader or more robust music industry, mm -hmm, per se, mm -hmm. but it certainly has led to a broader and more robust tech-related in music industry. Is it the tech that then drives the innovation, or the tech becomes a way that a new pattern is possible but may not actually catch on, or may catch on later? Historically, the modern music industry has always been driven by technology. The first uh, machination of that is really the player piano, right? 
and I mean, I don't know if this is widely known information, but... And that's just a few years ago. Just a few years ago, yeah. A little, you know, slightly before I was born. <laughs> okay. So the music industry has always been technologically driven from the time of the, the player piano through the invention of the turntable and then tape and then... And the jukebox, actually, someplace jukebox, in between. Jukebox. Because that sets uh, some of the rules we actually still live by in terms of music. Absolutely, as did... Uh, safe haven laws and counterfeit records being sold at festivals. So we've had lots of different technologies that may or may not have caught on that each of them sets a precedent? Correct. That we all live with with the next technology that comes? Correct. CSAC's biggest competitors, and maybe competitors is not really a right, is it not really a good word? Coopetition? Yeah, coopetition. That might be better. But ASCAP and BMI are are governed by sets of laws that were written in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Those are called consent decrees. And if you looked at the music industry in the 1950s versus now, you would argue how is it possible for a company to operate in the modern in modern times using handcuffs designed from the 1950s. I think a lot of people are having that conversation in public right now. Not necessarily about your two competition partners, but um, the fact that we're now looking at a lot of rules and regs that are still trying to deal with a business from the 1950s as well as a business from 2015 and 2016. Absolutely right. It's a, a hot topic. Internal innovation, we've got process innovation, we've got product in the marketplace? What are kind of the things that you see are the the real areas that really are driving innovation right now in, in music all around? Well, I think, it, you know, the, the main innovation driver in music right now is, remains distribution. CD sales are all but dead, except for the one anomaly in Adele, as we've seen. Dead or that the numbers have just continued to get swampy? I mean, if you look at the, pr- the proportion, there's still CD sales happening, and it's bigger than vinyl, and they yes. heading in a different direction than vinyl. Yes, but far smaller than the amount of music consumed online. Mm-hmm. I should say it's an infinitesimal percentage of the music that's consumed online. That's what I mean by dead. The model is no longer ownership, it's access. Mm-hmm. When it comes to access and you, you're looking at a industry that's, 100 years old and has contracts that go back to the 1930s and we're specifically only addressing issues of radio play and record sales, how do you address a stream and how do you address an internet performance as opposed to a stream? There's a lot of activity around how these songs and masters are licensed and who gets paid for what and how much they get paid. It's a pretty exciting place to be in the industry. The way people experience music is also what's driving innovation. Spotify, Pandora, YouTube are what's happening right now. But if we look back five years, six years ago, those things weren't really on anybody's radar yet. So what's ha- what's being developed now that in three, four, five years will be making Spotify and or YouTube look like the comparison of, say, Facebook to MySpace, right? You know, there's a lot of development right now in virtual reality as far as experiencing music goes. Google Glass, Google Cardboard app, have you seen this? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the apps that they've launched with in the Google Cardboard is a 3D experience with several artists, including U2. And you wear the Google Cardboard box and you listen on your headphones and you're in a room with Bono and The Edge as they sing this song to you and they move it around the world. It's a pretty incredible experience. We have a a mutual friend who is also in the VR space uh, and his company offers... You're talking about Vantage TV. Vantage TV, Mm -hmm. correct. His company offers full concert experiences And you watch the concert in your front row center, you're behind the stage, you're stage left, stage right, and you're virtually in the experience, right? right? And when I tried his technology, it made me think of DTS and what they do with uh, immersive sound. 
perhaps they have the Florence and the Machine concert and DTS does a mix of it so that when a person experiences the virtual reality, they actually hear the direction of the sound as well. Right, and that's a lot of what's happening with different philosophies now in virtual reality is how do they think about positioning and having how, it, how the music pans, and there's quite a few technologies. All Coming into this new space, when you think, well, what is new in the recording side and the playback side? Well, when you start having it so that the listener is in motion versus the music, it starts opening up new opportunities. Absolutely right. What's been, other than the rights issues, which you are hip deep in, what's been your biggest surprise at taking a look at innovation in music, both in your own work and what you're seeing? Outside of rights management, the biggest surprise has been the sort of evolution of the consumer as the director of what they want to experience rather than the industry putting forth a great new experience. I think it's coming from kids in their bedrooms and and in their dorm rooms and incubator uh, companies who have an idea about how music can be experienced or accessed or delivered in a way that's more... Uh, convenient for the current audience and innovating on those concepts rather than from if you look back at say Sony and the RCA model who not only delivered the hardware but delivered the software to go into the hardware and it's it's completely outside in at this point is that the right, a good way to put it I mean well, you could also say that iTunes is of that ilk as well so iTunes is, and they're going through their, you know, they're going through another machination where they're going from iTunes being the model to Apple Music, and they've bought Beats, and they're trying to go toe to toe with Spotify, and they're realizing the, I don't want to say decline of of MP3 sales, but it's certainly the stagnation. Of well, there's that. been some decline, which have snuck out in the numbers. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> you said it, not me. So well, no, but it's, 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 it's not It's factual. From, it is factual. So, and, and Apple is also a company that's always been known for disrupting itself. But whether or not Apple is able to continue to drive distribution and music platforms for the industry, I don't know. But you're saying it's coming from young kids... Incubators, accelerators, absolutely um, hackathons. Hackathons, yep. There's the new uh, Nashville Project Music Incubator that's also, I think, having uh, the time of the recording at Second Class going through. Are you guys then, as an organization, and you as a professional, watching innovation and trying to help it into existence in ways that that benefit you and your firm? How do you keep track of then kid-driven innovation or? individual or small company driven innovation as well as what's coming from the large companies. So going back to the conversation that we were just having about engaging with music and having to negotiate rights, there is a, and this is on a global scale because the laws change from territory to territory, there is going to be a constant need for people to have access to the rights of music. And I think that that is what CSAC is working very hard at addressing mm-hmm. right now. So that if we can combine, and we, we've recently purchased Harry Fox, whose, whose main job was to issue mechanical licenses. And a mechanical license, for those who don't know, is the right to embed a copyright into a tangible medium, such as a CD or a piece of vinyl or a cassette, right? And or now a digital file. Or now a digital digital performance, yes. Mm-hmm. So like uh, Section 115 of the, the Copyright Act is a whole other conversation that we can have. So we bought Harry Fox. We have another company called Rumblefish, which is a micro-sync platform. Uh, which What's it, micro-sync? So there are tens of thousands, if not millions, of songs being used as the soundtrack for... UGC being uploaded onto user generated content. So I got to keep doing that. Okay. I don't, yeah, you, that's great. <laughs> well, so, no, but most people would probably know, but I would must admit that a lot of my own undergraduate students are kind of post UGC because it's their normal media. Right. So they don't think of it as user generated content, it is content. Right. So we tend to break it into UGC versus, the, my favorite one is Spug, semi professional user generated. Got it. Which didn't catch on. I love that one. Well, <laughs> so, so, it, 
be it Spug or UGC, <laughs> you know, somebody takes a video of their niece's fourth birthday party and a Katy Perry song is playing in the background as their niece dances around to Roar and they upload it onto YouTube to share with the rest of their family, there are copyright violations that have happened with that. Or copyright opportunities that happen with that. So uh, companies like Rumblefish are trying to address the violation as an opportunity and help a person obtain a license for the synchronization that occurred with the filming of the niece's birthday party and offer them the opportunity to say, here's $25 for the use of Roar in this thing. It goes up on YouTube legally. But isn't that some of the real opportunities? So I'm assuming that you guys are working with Flippergram. Flippergram is a huge... Yeah, it's a huge opportunity right now. So Flippogram being the ability then to take a small snippet of music and put it to that beautiful birthday party scene or child learning to walk right. on a legal basis with right. the music actually being delivered intentionally for the activity. That's absolutely correct. So, so in many ways, that awkwardness of the opportunity and needing a microtransaction to afford it and the, and the license being dealt with as a package and not as an individual action is where some of the innovation is coming from right now. Absolutely right. And it's also where we think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. But when you have music user, when a fan of music has literally the world's repertoire at its fingertips and could be licensing the or wanting to use something written by an artist in Brazil who happens to be through a myriad of contracts under license from Universal Music Group in Los Angeles and CSAC also here in Los Angeles. How does that person know how to obtain those rights? They don't. Right, or they, they don't even know that it's an that option. it's an issue. Yeah. So the Flippergrams, the YouTubes, the Spotify's, all of these places are building businesses on the backs of music creators. They have to have ways to obtain the rights to music, and their biggest complaint will be that the music industry is so disorganized and so fragmented that there's no one easy way to license a song. Let's look at Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. Dark Horse, she signed to Capital, and it features an artist who happens to be signed to Columbia. Then there become two record companies involved. And that's just the rights issues. It, it seems to me some of the real opportunities are in the flow side, so that all of this stuff is happening, that it's both then the identification then and after the fact, and then also making sure that the money all gets to the right Places. places, absolutely correct. And, and is that changing or getting more liquid or building more capacity? Or is that a, maybe an opportunity for future improvements? I think it's all of the above. I mean, that's certainly where the opportunity lies. And if we work at it and we're able to put together the right offerings, we can change the way that that music is accessed and how the the metadata that's attached either intentionally or unintentionally to a song gets transferred from creator to distributor to lay person who doesn't really want to know anything about it but because of what they're doing either on Flippergram or YouTube has involved themselves in the music licensing process. Or then a technology company or a new channel that would like to be able to have that all feed in without having to learn everything from scratch and pay lawyer fees all over again. Correct. So, and then revenues coming from that new opportunity set that do need then to come into the pipe to get to, to artists wherever they are. That's and right. And all their people. That's right. An interesting opportunity mess. So um, we talked about several opportunities and changes happening now. What are the next innovations coming and what might need to be created to make this all work better? So that's one of the really exciting things about being in the music industry because everybody thinks they know. When you have the ability to create these experiences like we were talking about from bedrooms or incubators or accelerators or hackathons, you don't know what's going to be next, but you know the problem that's going to come with whatever's next, right? And that problem continues to be access. And by access, I mean rights access. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're focused on. Uh, we've covered a lot of things. Thank you very much, Sam, for this, this great conversation. 
we've talked about a few companies in passing, mm -hmm. but not talking about you guys. Mm -hmm. What would be two or three companies that you're excited about that or intrigued by that are changing music now or that you see coming in the future with the work they're doing? And I don't own stock in the company. I just have a friend who lives, who works there. I love what DTS is doing. Mm -hmm. I've connected not not only the virtual reality company that we mentioned, but I've connected some of our artists with them so that DTS could provide them with... And DTS does? Immersive sound technology. Okay. As long as it's encapsulated with the immersive sound technology, you can listen on any set of headphones and it literally sounds like you're sitting in the room with the performers. Without experiencing it, it's very hard to explain. Mm -hmm. I've introduced some of our artists with them so that DTS will provide them with free mixes of their next album in this immersive sound. And that, you know, that's a, that's a win for everybody involved. On the synchronization level, there's a company called Choir that I absolutely... C-H-O... No, Q W I R E. It's a business to business company, so it's a it's not something that the general music consumption com uh, world would ever experience. But what they do is provide the ability for music rights holders to embed their copyrights and masters on a frame by frame basis in any film or television show in which choir is the sort of database that marries music to picture. And what does this do? This allows rights holders to license their music on a free market basis, but also gives the licensee the ability to have a direct relationship in a very uh, streamlined manner with the rights holders. Why is that cool? Because if anybody, anybody who's worked in the synchronization process knows that there's five producers on a TV show, a director, a music supervisor, music editors, a lot of ears have to experience something matched to picture before it actually gets locked to picture. And then there's a whole slew of clearance people on both the TV studio side as well as the rights holder side that needs to go out for approvals on those things. One of my jobs at the old BMG was clearing music for major motion pictures and films and advertisers. And when you have an, an artist or a songwriter who co-writes something with three or four different writers who may or may not be published by the same person, by the same entity, you know, you have to go out to a number of different publishers and then each one of them has to go to the songwriter and get an approval, right? So it's a long, arduous process that's not clean and easy. Inquires helping to clean that process up. Cool. Any last thoughts as we wrap up? As hard as it is to be a musician in today's world or to be a record company or to be a music publisher in today's world, there's not a better time in the history of music to be in the business. It's incredibly exciting. And there's tremendous amount of opportunity. We may not have another Beatles and you may not have artists and songwriters who become billionaires by being artists and songwriters. They may have to do what, what Dre has done to become a billionaire, but the opportunity exists and there's not a better, never been a better time. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Good. Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at innovation.schoolofmusic.ucla.edu. Join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music. Thanks again.